So in this lecture, we just want to do a brief overview of the analysis procedure that we're going to continue in this full section of the course. So we're going to give you essentially the roadmap now of the various different steps we have to take in this direct stiffness method. So the first step we take is to calculate the global stiffness matrix for each element. Now we've seen this matrix before, we've actually derived this matrix. This is the global stiffness matrix for an element that has been transferred into the global coordinate system. So we start off with the stiffness matrix for the element, which is just a four by four uh, stiffness matrix. And in order to transfer that into the global coordinate system, we use a transformation matrix. And again, we've seen that in a previous lecture. So this captures, this matrix captures the orientation of each member. Now it's important that we do capture that orientation because once we have this global stiffness matrix that encodes the orientation of the member, we can directly combine these together to form what's called a primary stiffness matrix. Matrix, and that's the next step. So we build this primary stiffness matrix for the structure by collecting together the element global stiffness matrices. So the primary stiffness matrix, it doesn't take account of the supports, but just how the elements relate to each other in the structure. So the primary stiffness matrix is a square matrix. It's an N by N matrix where N is the number of degrees of freedom in our structure. So remember, the number of degrees of freedom for a pin jointed structure like this, or like what we're analyzing in this course, the number of degrees of freedom is the number of nodes in your structure multiplied by the number of degrees of freedom per node. And each node is going to have two degrees of freedom because it can move horizontally and it can move vertically. So again, the number of degrees of freedom here determines the size of that primary stiffness matrix. So that's step two. Step three is to take our primary stiffness matrix and impose knowledge of our support conditions on it. So these are support conditions. They're also often termed boundary conditions. So we know what's happening on the boundaries of our structure. And typically what's happening on those boundaries is the displacement is equal to zero. So that's what we know. And we impose this knowledge on our primary stiffness matrix to determine or to obtain what's called the structure stiffness matrix. Now, imposing that knowledge of the boundary conditions is going to effectively mean that we reduce our primary stiffness matrix down, we simplify it. So I'm showing here a matrix with a whole load of zeros in it, ones in the diagonals, and then a central portion in the middle here, uh, which actually still contains some numbers. Uh, so we're going to see exactly what I mean by that now in this section uh, when we actually look at a numerical example. So again, the primary stiffness matrix, step two, is all about capturing the, the, the makeup of the structure. And then the structure stiffness matrix reduces that primary stiffness matrix down um, by imposing knowledge of our boundary conditions or our support conditions on that primary stiffness matrix. The next step is to solve for the nodal displacements. So what you can see here is the, the common relationship. Force is equal to stiffness times displacement. All we need to do is invert that structure stiffness matrix and multiply it by the force vector, and that will give us our displacements. We're essentially solving a system of linear equations here. That's all. Now, this is where the, the, the expense, if you like, this is where this method is computationally expensive, and it all really relates to inverting that square structure stiffness matrix. And this is why this particular method suits a computer so, so well. The next step is to multiply the nodal displacement, which we found in step four, by the primary stiffness matrix, and that will give us our reaction forces. So that's pretty straightforward. And step six is to use the nodal displacements to determine the member forces. Remember, there's if we've got a structure, there's pretty much um, three different pieces of information we want to find out. We want to find out the displacements of the nodes. We want to find out the reaction forces, and we also want to find out the member forces. So once we've worked out what the nodal displacements are, we can use those to determine the force in each member. And it's, it's a pretty straightforward concept. And, you know, it's the same concept this entire analysis method is built on. And it's this idea that force is equal to stiffness times displacement. Now, I want to find force. I know the stiffness of each element. And now, after step four, I also know the displacement of each element. So capturing that in an equation, I'd end up with the force in a member. So the force in member IJ is equal to the stiffness of that member, EA over L, times the local nodal displacements for that member. Okay, so remember, we know what those are. We know the nodal displacements. So if I know the displacement at each end of the member, I essentially know what the elongation or shortening of that member is 
and I can multiply that by the stiffness to get the force in the member. So that's it, it's a, it's a relatively straightforward process. It's very formulaic. So we, we start off by calculating the global stiffness matrix for each element. We use those to build the primary stiffness matrix for the structure, so that's our model of our structure. We impose our boundary conditions, our support conditions, onto the, onto the primary stiffness matrix, which gives us the structure stiffness matrix. We solve for the unknown nodal displacements by inverting that structure stiffness matrix. We can substitute back in then to calculate the reaction forces by multiplying the nodal displacements by the primary stiffness matrix. And then we can use knowledge of those nodal displacements to determine the member forces. So as I said, it's a very step-by-step, -step, very formulaic process, and it really is crying out for a programmatic solution. Obviously, that's what we're, that's what we're aiming for in this course. So those are the, the various different steps. Next, we will work our way through a numerical example just to, to bring these different steps to life and just to demonstrate for you the various different steps. So we'll pick that up in the next lecture.